Alright, we're getting to the final part. The human body. Most exciting. Nobody ever comes to visit me. What am I, chopped liver? Oh, I wish you'd come up and see me sometime. Casting about for something to bone up on? Take a break with me. Hi, they call me the germ man. Catch me inside. tall are you now? Well, you'll probably grow for several years yet and then you'll stop. But what makes us stop growing? It has to do with the endocrine glands in our bodies. Glands are tissues in the body that produce and secrete hormones. Hormones are chemicals that regulate growth, development, and reproduction. These hormones tell us to keep growing till we're big enough. In adolescence, we have a big growth spurt, and after that we slow down and eventually stop. Girls usually reach their full height by the age of 15, whereas some boys grow until they're over 21 years old. But everybody grows at a different pace. So if you're in the front row when your class lines up for a group photograph, don't be so sure things are going to stay that way. You might even end up being the tallest. How does that apple you're munching on turn into energy your body can use? It happens through a process called digestion. Here's how it works. The first stop is the mouth, where some of the apple's starches are broken down into sugars by saliva. Mm -hmm. Next, the chewed apple goes down a tube called the pharynx, which connects the back of the mouth to another tube called the esophagus. This leads to the stomach. Here, digestive juices mix with the apple piece to break down protein. That piece of apple will stay in the stomach with digestive juices working away at it until it's almost liquid. Then it moves into the small intestine. Here, more digestive juices break down the food even further. The part of the apple that's not completely digested goes into the large intestine, where much of the water is absorbed before it leaves the body as waste material. Just what are those powerful digestive juices that break down every bite you take? Well, the first one is in the saliva, and it's called amylase. Amylase breaks up starches into maltose, a form of sugar. The stomach then produces up to four pints of digestive juices, including hydrochloric acid and pepsin. Most of the digestion takes place in the small intestines, aided by digestive juices from the pancreas and liver. These are just a few of the things the body uses to break food down into the nutrients we need. You probably know that eating too many hot fudge sundaes can make you gain weight. Sundaes have a lot of calories. But exactly what is a calorie? A calorie is just a measurement, not of fat, as most people might expect, but of heat. A gram calorie is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. A large calorie is 1,000 times bigger and it's what we use to measure the energy value of food. Calories are the amount of work a fuel, in this case food, can do. Your body needs calories from healthy food just like a car needs gas to keep going. The more active you are, the more calories you need. But if you eat too many calories for your activity level, your body stores the energy as fat so you can use it later. That's when those Sundays can turn into extra ripples around your middle instead of extra home runs. 
How many calories do you think there are in your favorite foods? Click on the colors to find out. One teaspoon of sugar has only 15 calories. Surprised? Your favorite chocolate chip cookie contains about 60 calories. One fried egg provides 115 calories. This half cup serving of ice cream contains 130 calories. One slice of cheese pizza runs 185 calories. Hold the pepperoni, please. This slice of chocolate cake has about 235 calories. A regular order of French fries contains about 220 calories. You say you prefer those fast food super burgers? Then be prepared to work off a whopping 670 calories. Did you know that when your body burns food to make energy, it produces enough heat to bring 25 quarts of water to the boiling point every day? Fortunately, all that heat doesn't stay inside you. One of the ways the body cools itself is through perspiration. Our body temperature is kept normal by the temperature center in the brain. There are three parts to it, a heating center, a cooling center, and a control center. When your blood temperature drops, the heating center sets off glands, muscles, and the liver. Your body burns more fuel and your temperature rises. When blood temperature gets too high, the cooling center goes to work and your body burns fuel more slowly. Tiny vessels in the skin open so extra heat can radiate away. Fluid flows out of the minute pores in the skin, and we begin to perspire. As these tiny drops evaporate, they carry away body heat and cool us off. How do you suppose our lives would be different if we didn't have an efficient temperature system in our bodies? Well, that's how it is for reptiles and fish. They are cold-blooded animals. This doesn't mean that their blood is cold. It means that their body temperature changes with the air or water temperature. When the sun is hot, their body temperature rises. In cold weather, their body temperature falls. That's why they move to cool shade or deeper in the water when the day is warmest. They come out during the cooler parts of the day, dawn and dusk. But cold-blooded animals must also be careful about getting too cold. They have to constantly move from place to place to maintain the correct temperature. Have you ever seen someone who has measles? It may look like red polka dots painted on their skin, but of course it's really a disease. Measles is caused by an extremely tiny germ called a virus. Measles is very contagious, which means that the germ can be easily passed from one person to another. About a week and a half after you've been exposed to measles, you could begin to show signs of the disease. Red spots appear in your throat and mouth. You might have a fever, your nose runs, and you start to cough. A couple of days later, you'll get those red dots and your temperature will get higher. The whites of your eyes will redden and they might become sensitive to light. Fortunately, measles usually doesn't last long. You start to feel better just when the rash starts to look the worst. And you'll be glad to know that once you've had measles, you can usually never get them again. Measles is usually a childhood disease, but adults who've never had it can still get it. Fortunately, you usually get measles only once in your life. That's because your body builds up an immunity or resistance to the virus, which makes it impossible for that virus to give you the measles a second time. So is there some way you can build up this resistance before you get the measles? Sure. You can get an injection of measles vaccine from your doctor. And here's an odd fact. Measles usually appear in the spring, but very seldom in the winter. If you've ever grafted a broken tree branch back together, you have some idea of how a broken bone heals. 
Human bone is so strong, it's a wonder it ever does break. Bone can carry a load 30 times greater than brick. The shin bone, the strongest bone in the body, can support a load of 3,600 pounds. Still, bones do break, and with a little help from nature, they can be mended. First, a doctor will have to bring the broken pieces together into their normal position. Then the body takes over. Bone tissue has an amazing ability to heal itself. Within a few hours after a break, young connective tissue begins to form. Three to four days later, a large mass of cells and calcium has formed tissue that is already beginning to unite the bone pieces. As more calcium is deposited, hard bone develops and the break is mended. While the arm heals, you'll have to wear a cast for about six weeks. Just enough time to have everyone in school sign it. Doctors have different terms to describe a broken bone, depending on how seriously it's cracked. If the bone is just cracked, with part of it splintered but the rest intact, it's called an infraction or an incomplete fracture. A complete break in two pieces is called a simple fracture, although it doesn't seem very simple to the victim. If the bone is broken in more than two pieces, or is shattered, this is called a common ute fracture. A break which is so bad that parts of bone stick out through the muscle and skin is called a compound fracture. You know that it's a good idea to cover your nose when you sneeze so others won't catch your germs. But just what are those germs that seem to float around and attack people? Well, germs are tiny one-celled organisms. They're so small that we can only see them with a microscope. Germs are either living cells such as bacteria and protozoa or very tiny chemicals called viruses. Germs are very specialized. Certain germs cause specific illnesses. When you get a disease from a germ, your body will probably destroy the germs, and you'll be fine again. As a matter of fact, sometimes you'll never get that same disease again. That's because your body builds up protection or immunity against that particular kind of germ. That's why most people only get measles or chicken pox once. People had all kinds of explanations for what caused illnesses before they discovered germs. Primitive people often thought that illnesses were caused by evil spirits or by spells put on the sick person by an enemy. But a major breakthrough was made in 1876 when Robert Koch, a German scientist, discovered the germ that causes anthrax, a disease of farm animals. As Koch was proving that germs were the cause of certain diseases, Frenchman Louis Pasteur was demonstrating how vaccines could be made from the same germs. So, for over a hundred years now, we've developed medicines to prevent or cure germ-caused diseases. Most people think that lungs are large, oddly shaped balloons that take in and blow out air. But actually, they're composed of a maze of thousands of tiny air sacs. When you breathe in, your lungs expand and air goes into these air sacs. The sacs are separated from each other by very thin walls filled with small blood vessels called capillaries. Air passes easily through these walls. When you breathe out, the lungs partly collapse, and air is forced out through the upper tubes. The fresh air you breathe in, or inhale, brings oxygen to your lungs, then to the rest of the body. When you breathe out, or exhale, unwanted gases such as carbon dioxide are released. Try taking a very deep breath. How much air can you take in? 
a full-grown adult can hold between five and seven pints in his or her lungs. The amount of air the lungs can hold is called the vital capacity. Breathing is usually an involuntary action, one that just happens, even when we don't think about it. But we can voluntarily control our breathing, too. We do that when we hold our breath underwater. What do you think it would be like if we had to think about breathing all the time? It'd certainly be something you'd never want to forget. And here's something else you don't want to forget. Smoking is bad for your lungs. It lowers vital capacity and makes it hard for the lungs to take in enough oxygen for the cells in your body. So don't smoke, and you won't waste your breath. At three pounds, the average human liver weighs almost as much as a football. It's the largest gland in the body. But do you know what purpose it serves? For one thing, the liver produces a digestive juice called bile. Bile helps break down fat from food into very fine droplets that can be easily digested. The liver also transforms poisons, such as nicotine, alcohol, and caffeine, into compounds that the body can get rid of, unless you take in so much that the liver can't handle it. One more thing the liver does. It stores minerals, vitamins, and surplus food for the body to use. The liver is a major part of your digestive system, and your body would really be in trouble if your liver didn't work well. Have you ever heard someone say, you've got a lot of gall? Usually that means the person has done or said something really nasty. But what does this have to do with gall, which is just another word for the digestive juice bile? Well, it goes back to the ancient Greeks who thought that everyone had a very bitter body fluid called bile or gall. Too much bile was supposed to make you mean. The idea caught on even though our knowledge of the digestive system is a lot more accurate now. And that's why the phrase is still used today. Did you know that it's just as important for your body to get rid of what it doesn't need as it is for it to take in what it does need? That's where your kidneys come in. They remove unwanted substances from the body and control the amount of water in the blood. You have two flat, bean-shaped kidneys, one on either side of the spine, above the waistline. In the outer part of each kidney are ball-like structures covered by a delicate membrane. There are about one and a half million of these balls called glomeruli in each kidney. They allow waste fluid to pass from the blood into the kidneys. This waste fluid, called urine, is collected into the glomeruli, drains down tiny tubes, then goes into larger tubes that connect the kidneys to the bladder. If the kidneys didn't work properly, waste materials would poison the blood. Hospitals now have special machines that can do the kidney's job, in case of kidney failure. Remember, if the kidneys don't work right, the body can't get rid of dangerous waste. Fortunately, if one kidney fails, the other one can carry on alone. But if both kidneys fail, you've got to take some drastic steps. One process is called dialysis. That's where a person's blood is cleaned by a machine, sort of a mechanical kidney. The patient is hooked up to the dialysis machine about once a week, and his blood is filtered through the system to remove all the waste. Sometimes it's possible to take out a bad kidney and replace it with a new one. This is called a kidney transplant. Doctors have to be very careful to match the new kidney with the old one as closely as possible so the body doesn't reject the new organ. And the patient has to take a lot of medicine. Still, a successful transplant can change a very sick patient into a healthy, active person. Every animal has a brain, from a horsefly to a horse. 
Many of the lower animals have very simple brains that don't do much more than control automatic activities. But the human brain is incredibly complex and allows us to think, remember, and communicate. The biggest part of the human brain is the cerebrum, and it's divided into two equal halves, called the right and left hemispheres. The surface of both hemispheres is covered with wrinkles and folds. The more developed the type of animal, the greater the number of wrinkles and folds on its brain. Under the cerebrum, near the back of the skull, is the cerebellum. The last part of the brain is the medulla oblongata, a thumb-sized part at the top of the spinal cord. Each part of your brain has its own job, from remembering your name to keeping you from wiping out on your skateboard. Which part of your brain is which? Click on a part and find out. The largest part of the brain, the cerebrum, controls thinking, reasoning, problem solving, and memory. Your involuntary actions such as breathing, heartbeat, circulation, and blinking are controlled here in the medulla oblongata. The cerebellum controls balance, muscle movement, and coordination. It has a lot to do with your athletic performance. If you've had your tonsils out, you might wonder what they're good for, besides a lot of ice cream after the operation. Actually, our tonsils do help us. Most scientists believe they're the first things to protect us against infections that enter through the nose and mouth. Tonsils are bundles of special kinds of tissue called lymphoid, and they're located in several places in the throat and in back of the tongue. Tonsils are covered by the same smooth membrane that lines the mouth. The membrane dips down to form deep, thin pockets called crypts, which trap germs and other harmful material from the mouth. White blood cells destroy the germs and alert the body's immune system to possible infection. So as bothersome as tonsils can be if they're sore, they do an important job for us. Our mouths are usually full of germs and bacteria. With tonsils there to trap them, we get sick far less often than we would without them. Most people think we have only two tonsils, located on either side of the throat, just behind the tongue. Actually, we have several pairs of tonsils of different sizes. The largest pair is near the palate. They're called the palatine tonsils. When the doctor asks you to open your mouth and say, ah, that's where he's checking for infection. Another small pair is just below the surface in the back of the tongue. And in the back of your throat, you have a smaller pair of tonsils called the pharyngeal tonsils. When these tonsils get enlarged, they're known as adenoids. If germs become active inside the tonsils themselves, they may cause an infection called tonsillitis. This usually happens in the palatine tonsils, and it can make them enlarged, red, and sore. Tonsillitis develops more often in childhood than in infancy or adulthood, and it happens most frequently in winter, when you get cold. When you think about valentines and broken hearts, it makes the heart seem like a very delicate organ. But actually, although the adult heart is only about the size of a fist, in one day it produces enough energy to lift 150,000 pounds. That's about the weight of a locomotive. Weighing in at just 8 to 12 ounces, your heart is one of the strongest muscles in your body. Its job is to pump blood through your lungs, then throughout the body. This circulates the oxygen in the blood to all your cells and organs. The heart does this by powerful pumping movements called contractions that push the blood through your bloodstream. The heart keeps the blood moving constantly, bringing oxygen to the cells and removing carbon dioxide. When you hear your heartbeat, you're really hearing the sound of your heart's valves closing between contractions, and it does this 42 million times a year.
Your heart is built a little like two houses right next to each other. Each house has a room upstairs, the left and right oracles, and another room downstairs, the left and right ventricles. There are doors called valves between the oracle and ventricle on each side, but none between the houses. These valves between the upstairs and downstairs rooms must fit very tightly because once blood is squeezed out from the heart, it must not flow back through the same door. The valves open and shut with each heartbeat. Both houses are like pumps. The left side pumps blood that has received oxygen from the lungs into the body. After the body's organs use the oxygen, the blood flows back to the right side, which sends it again to the lungs for more oxygen. The heart beats about 100,000 times a day, 90 to 100 times a minute in a child. But the heart pumps two and a half times faster when you exercise because then your body needs more oxygen. You probably know how to find your pulse, but what exactly does your pulse rate tell you? First of all, your pulse rate is the number of times your heart pumps each minute. Knowing your pulse rate gives you an idea of how good a job your heart is doing circulating the blood around your body. You see, the heart's pumping action is controlled by a major artery called the aorta. The aorta expands and fills with blood. Then it contracts and the blood is pumped out. The major cause of the pulse is the rush of blood being forced into the aorta by the heart. When the aorta contracts, the blood that's just come from the heart is forced through the circulatory system, the vast highway of veins and arteries that carry blood throughout the body. So you see, your pulse rate tells you not only how fast your heart is beating, but also about the general condition of your entire circulatory system. You can learn to take your own pulse. Just put the index finger of one hand on the thumb side of the other wrist like this. If you can't find your pulse there, try the vein on the side of your neck. Now you could count how many beats there are in one minute, 60 seconds. But you can save time by counting the number of beats in six seconds and then multiplying that number by 10. Just add a zero. Either way, the answer will be your pulse rate. Heart attacks and other heart diseases are the major cause of death in the United States today. But what actually attacks the heart in a heart attack? Well, nothing exactly. A heart attack is an injury to the heart which occurs when the heart doesn't get enough blood. A healthy heart receives all the blood and oxygen it needs to do its pumping job. But sometimes the coronary arteries that supply blood to the heart get clogged up. When this happens, the tissue of the affected part of the heart begins to die. This type of heart attack is called a coronary thrombosis, or just a coronary. Heart attacks are always very serious, but they're not always fatal. Today, there are many things doctors can do for a heart attack patient. There's even an operation called a bypass, where a doctor replaces a clogged artery with an open one. Although most heart attacks occur to older people, it's never too early to start taking good care of yourself to ward off heart attacks when you get older. You can start by watching what you eat and how much you eat. An overweight person puts too much strain on his heart, and too much cholesterol, a substance found in animal products such as meat and eggs, can also contribute to heart attacks. All muscles benefit from exercise, especially the heart. You usually get enough exercise when you're young, but older people should exercise too. Don't smoke now or when you grow up. It's terrible for your heart and lungs. Also, if other members of your family have had heart attacks, you have to take extra care of yourself. But if you eat right, get exercise, and have medical checkups, you've given yourself a better chance already.